Hey, good morning. Uh, ni hao. Um, uh, welcome to, uh, I guess it's the first session after the keynote, so uh, thanks for uh, coming by. Um, can, can people hear me okay with the, the mic? Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, some experiences we've had with an enterprise microservice system, um, the IBM Cloud Console um, in particular, um, experiences we've had moving that from Cloud Foundry um, to Kubernetes. Uh, my name's Tony Irwin. I'm a senior technical staff member at IBM. I had a, a colleague, Jonathan Schweikart, who, uh, who uh, co-authored these slides, but he was not able uh, to make the trip. Um, so, I'm, so a quick agenda. I'm going to give an overview of the, uh, the console, um, the app that I work on, um, talk a little bit about what Cloud Foundry is, um, what Kubernetes is, and why we wanted to switch in the first place. Um, then we'll talk about some spe specific experiences and things we learned along the way, um, and then we'll uh, conclude. So the uh, the IBM Cloud Console is a uh, is a pretty large um, UI um, made up of a number of microservices, which we'll get into in a second. Um, that's kind of the front door to the IBM Cloud. Um, so it allows you to manage all of your IaaS and PaaS resources you might create in the cloud. Um, also allows you to see your billing info, um, system status, um, docs, um, manage identity and, and access management. Um, all of that is, is part of the, uh, the console. Um, th this chart shows a basic overview of, of the console architecture. Um, about five years ago or so, we started this uh, project. And we started it out as a, as a monolithic app. So we had a Java back end um, with a Dojo um, based front end. And uh, we found over time, um, I could give a whole talk about why <laughs> we left Monolith to go to microservices. Um, but uh, you know, it wasn't really scalable for what we wanted to do. We wanted other teams to be able to contribute easily on their own schedules, um, et cetera. So we've, we slowly evolved um, that monolithic app to a microservice system um, which now has about uh, 50 different microservices. Um, the, the chart here, the, the diagram basically shows the console client, which is the browser, um, makes a connection into the, our proxy, our reverse proxy, which does all the routing to our different microservices. So slash catalog would go to our catalog microservice, um, things like that. Um, all of these microservices talk to um, backend APIs from the IBM cloud and uh, we also have a set of, I mentioned other teams wanting to contribute, et cetera. Our proxy also routes through to a number of other uh, teams uh, that are outside of my core console team. So, so we end up with a pretty large, loosely coupled experience. Um, this, this system was originally deployed as microservices to Cloud Foundry, um, but uh, here, uh, now we're deployed to Kubernetes, and that's really the, the topic of this discussion. So, so what is Cloud Foundry? So it provides a uh, platform as a service, PaaS, um, with a really abstracting at the application layer. Um, developers can focus on code um, rather than underlying infrastructure. Um, it leverages the Open Service Broker API um, so that it's easy to use services from apps. It uh, uses Diego containers internally. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty cool technology. Um, I will note I've got a, an asterisk at the bottom that I'm really talking about the cloud application or the cloud foundry application runtime environment. Um, there are, um, you know, it's one of the two open source components really that make up what people call a uh, cloud foundry. Um, Kubernetes has a slightly different model, um, abstracting at the container level. Um, some people um, call this IaaS plus. Um, it's got, you know, same benefits, a lot of the same benefits as PaaS, um, but the flexibility of IaaS. And in fact, you can even deploy Cloud Foundry on top of, of Kubernetes. Um, you know, th since this is KubeCon, I probably don't have to tell you a whole lot about what Kubernetes is, but it orchestrates computing, uh, networking, and storage infrastructure on behalf of the workloads, enables portability across providers, um, runs containers, as I mentioned, um, et cetera. Um, so why did we switch? Um, so there's nothing really wrong with Cloud Foundry. 
Um, it's very easy to get apps running, um, to get started, um, to focus on your code and get it deployed and running. Um, it's used um, by at least half of the Fortune 500 um, in some capacity or another, so it's pretty widely used uh, technology. Um, but we felt like Kubernetes um, offered a number of advantages for our use cases. Um, it, it, uh, you know, and I've got a whole list here that we could go on for a long time about, but uh, you know, more, more granular control um, of our large complex microservice system, as I mentioned, you know, 50 microservices and counting. Um, we, we had some problems in our Cloud Foundry deployment because we were sharing it with other people. Um, so by moving to Kubernetes, we were able to spin up dedicated clusters uh, and avoid some of this friendly fire. Um, now in fairness, you can also deploy Cloud Foundry in separate clusters. Um, so we could have also done it that way. Um, with the, especially with the IBM implementation of Cloud Foundry, um, by moving to uh, Kubernetes, we had a much simpler front door, you know, basically a network path into our cluster. Now we can really focus on configuring our, our Nginx ingress uh, within the cluster. Um, and we don't have some of the appliances and things that were in front of us um, in Cloud Foundry. Um, private host names is another reason we wanted to move. Um, so this is a microservice system and uh, all the host names in Cloud Foundry are public. Um, we didn't really want people um, from outside of the console to call these microservices um, without going through the proxy. Um, so Kubernetes allowed us to solve that. Um, we also saw a nice performance gain um, by using the private networking in Kubernetes um, so that you can make direct calls from microservice to microservice without leaving the cluster. Um, whereas in Cloud Foundry, we were doing you know, pretty large network tops. Um, we've, we've noticed a lot of improved memory and CPU usage um, over Cloud Foundry. Because um, in Cloud Foundry, the apps you have to sort of allocate in advance how much memory they might need. So maybe you, you allocate a gigabyte per instance and you have three instances. That's just you know, setting aside three gigabytes. Um, whereas Kubernetes is a little bit more uh, dynamic and uh, really makes pretty efficient use of memory and CPU. Um, Kubernetes um, gives us the flexibility, aside from just uh, deploying our microservices, um, to run local services like Redis um, and things that are, you know, and databases and whatever our microservices might need. And then, of course, it has um, integrated monitoring uh, with Prometheus. So this, this next part of the talk, we'll talk about some of the specific uh, issues um, that we had moving from Cloud Foundry um, to Kubernetes and you know, some of the lessons learned along the way. Um, this chart is really just um, comparing the, the Cloud Foundry flow um, with the kube flow. Um, so in Cloud Foundry, you've got a node application. Um, you, do, uh, you have a manifest file that says some things about the app name, et cetera. Um, and you do, uh, from the command line, you can do what's called a CF push command, and then ultimately Cloud Foundry uh, puts that app and runs it in a Diego container. Um, the kubeflow is still very, pretty similar, um, but, but there are some differences along the way. Um, you still have your node application, um, but instead of doing a CF push, um, you build a Docker image um, for that node app, and then you use a Helm uh, to install it into the cluster. Um, and I mentioned you know, Cloud Foundry has a manifest file, um, so we did have to deal um, with migrating that manifest uh, to Helm charts. Um, you know, Helm, uh, the Helm deployment will cover you know, the Docker image, um, CPU and memory um, that you set aside for the container, environment variables, um, et cetera. Um, you can use Helm to set up the ingress, you know, host name, URL mapping. Um, setting up the, the aliases for your services within your cluster. Um, so so that was, you know, the main difference there is just, you know, there's no longer the manifest file, but um, you're using Helm instead and get finer grain control. Um, Cloud Foundry really has a configuration, as I mentioned, that manifest file um, per deployment, um, whereas Kubernetes um, Helm um, is hierarchical uh, by nature, so it's a lot easier to to reuse configs across deployments. 
Um, I, I alluded to the fact that uh, all the host names in Cloud Foundry were public. Um, so, you know, one of the differences we had uh, was, you know, in Cloud Foundry, the public um, URLs were available, obviously, to everyone. Um, each microservice could be directly accessed from the internet, you know, which brings some additional security concerns, um, you know, common code that has to be repeated. Um, in Kubernetes, um, you can choose the exposure um, to give to your microservices. Um, so a service um, within Kubernetes, you can uh, you know, have only internal routes. So, so the private networking I mentioned before. And then if you set up the ingress, you can set up rules that do allow uh, folks from the outside to get to microservices. So, so basically protections are put in place at a higher level and you kind of you know, get to uh, have a little better security or a lot better security on your uh, internal microservices. Um, we did have, you know, we wanted to try to keep um, the same code running for our Cloud Foundry apps. Um, and, I, and I may have mentioned before, these are Node.js apps primarily. Um, we wanted to really keep that same code, whether we were running in Cloud Foundry or uh, Kubernetes in part because we had to run in both while, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but we needed to run in both environments while we're doing this migration. Um, if you're familiar with Cloud Foundry, there's some environment variables like VCAP services and port um, and things like that, that that are set. Those don't exist um, in Kubernetes, um, but we, like for VCAP services, um, we were able to, um, with our deployments, uh, basically set up that same environment variable with the information that you would expect in Cloud Foundry. This is basically, VCAP services is basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the host names and credentials and things you need to get to different, you know, say you, you, say you have a NoSQL database, um, VCAP services in Cloud Foundry would, would have all the information you need uh, to connect to that Cloud Foundry or to that uh, NoSQL database. Um, so we basically had to make that available in the, in the Kubernetes um, deployment of those apps as well. Um, the, you know, we had some issues in the code with URL formatting. Um, I would say it probably wasn't, you know, well coded in some, exam in some cases, but, but in Cloud Foundry, you know, we had a whole fully qualified host name for these services. Um, you know, in this case, it was acecommonproduction.ussouth.bluemix.net. In Kubernetes, you know, that same microservice, internally at least, would just be accessed with HTTPS common. Um, there was code in place that uh, uh, were constructing URLs based on, on the more fully uh, qualified domain name. So, so it's just, you know, things like that um, that we had to deal with in our uh, common code. Um, but, you know, with, with a few tweaks, we were able to uh, um, get all that working so that it could, uh, the node apps could run in both environments. Um, I mentioned before, um, one of the nice things we liked about Kubernetes was being able to install other services that our apps may want or need. Um, since this is a UI system, we have a need to share session state across our microservices, so we use Redis for that. Um, in our Cloud Foundry world, on the, the left-hand side here, we had, you know, had to deploy Redis completely separate from, from our environment. We had some VMs um, that we use to deploy all that. Um, and, you know, then, you know, you add, you know, security concerns with that as well as network latency um, with Redis not running necessarily right next to um, your apps. Um, in Kubernetes, we were just able to use, you know, Helm charts to, to deploy Redis into our uh, worker nodes. And uh, then we get a very, very fast call um, from our microservices to Redis, and it's all within our, our cluster. Um, I mentioned monitoring before. Um, you know, Cloud Foundry really doesn't have much monitoring built in. Um, so being able to deploy uh, Prometheus and uh, talking with some of my colleagues before, you know, with Istio and things like that that are coming um, or that are available, you know, that we want to start start exploring, we'll get a lot of additional monitoring and metrics as well. Um, one, one interesting thing we dealt with, um, with our Cloud Foundry deployment before, we were able to easily, uh, in Grafana, uh, chart and graph all of our inbound requests and, you know, those response times. 
um, status codes, et cetera. Um, when we moved to Kubernetes, we didn't have um, such easy access to that same information, or at least in a way, you know, we could get to the logs and such, but not, um, you know, able to easily mine that info and look at real-time uh, charts of that info. Um, so we configured Nginx to uh, log to syslog, and then we created a microservice that basically scraped that information and uh, gave us exactly the same info that we had previously. So that's, that's been pretty powerful for us. Um, one other area um, that maybe was a little bit unique to our situation, you know, since we do have a big microservice system um, that together makes up our, our UI, um, we, we're, we're changing some of this, but, but right now we still have a little bit of a monolithic deployment, actually. Um, so, so basically we have two copies of our microservices running, uh, one in a red namespace and the other in a black namespace. So at any given time, the actual production uh, microservices may be in black or red. Um, and then the, the code waiting to be promoted um, is running in the other one. Um, so basically, uh, when it comes time to promote, um, on the right-hand side, uh, our live URL and on-deck URLs are just basically sw swapped so that if red had our had what we wanted to be in production, it's now at the live URL, and black would be, you know, basically uh, demoted then. Um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you know, the, in Cloud Foundry we didn't really have this, um, but uh, each microservice is, is able to implement a readiness and a liveness check, um, which, um, basically allows um, Kubernetes, you know, all the, uh, all the uh, orchestration capabilities of Kubernetes to know if your, your apps are ready, if, if they're, they're down, if they need to be restarted, et cetera. I um, mean, Cloud Foundry uh, didn't really um, have, you know, there's a health manager that will restart your apps, your instances of your apps if they, they crash, but it's more like just, oh, we can't connect to it or we think it's dead. Um, so let's restart it, um, whereas you get a little bit, fine, again, finer grain control in Kubernetes. Um, I alluded uh, to the fact that we wanted to have the code be able to run in Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes at the same time. Um, the reason for that is uh, because we were developing at the same time, and, and we also wanted to vet what we were doing in Kubernetes alongside what we were doing in Cloud Foundry. Um, we we use a, uh, so this is kind of the, the architecture before we went to Kubernetes, um, that um, our console, bluemix.net, we have one URL um, for, for the console, um, and we've got, but we've got, you know, now we've got like nine different clusters around the world um, with the console deployed. Um, basically our requests go through Akamai, and Akamai then consults um, Dyn, um, which allows us to do geo load balancing. So, so basically it's gonna get the IP address of the nearest cluster, nearest healthy deployment of the console um, in the world. So if I'm in here in Shanghai, um, perhaps I would get uh, uh, the cluster IP address for Tokyo or Sydney. And uh, if, if Tokyo became unhealthy, um, we would start routing the traffic to, to Sydney. So trying to keep it closer um, to to where the users are. And in this, and even more importantly than keeping it close, um, if the, the odds of all nine, or you know, if you have five or six or seven, the odds of all of them worldwide being down at the same time are low, um, as opposed to any individual. So, so this geo load balancing, when we implemented it, um, really helped our, uh, our uptime and our, uh, you know, we use pager duty internally um, you know, it really reduced the, uh, the number of times pager duty alerts had to be sent out to someone at 2 a.m. to come fix a problem because we would just fail over and use another deployment. The, uh, um, so we, was, we had all that set up for Cloud Foundry is the point. And then when we wanted to start introducing our kube clusters, um, we kept the same, same infrastructure, you know, with Akamai and Dyn up top. Um, 
but in our dine rules, um, we started introducing uh, the, the purple boxes over there, which are Kubernetes. Um, so we actually had Cloud Foundry deployments, the green boxes, um, two green boxes up there, running side by side with our Kubernetes um, deployments. And we had the same geo load balancing and failover ability in place. And, and of course, if we had you know, turned on Kubernetes, um, you know, wasn't working correctly, we could fail back and remove all those clusters and just use our, our Cloud Foundry uh, deployments. And then over time, we, were, we got satisfied with uh, what we were doing uh, with Kubernetes. Um, so we eliminated all of our Cloud Foundry deployments and uh, just left with purple boxes, uh, which are all of our, our Kubernetes deployments. So, so it's kind of a practical consideration of if you're migrating from one of these technologies, um, in this case, CF to Kubernetes, you, know, you, you need to consider about how you're going to roll that out. And that's uh, the way we did it. And that kind of brings us to the end, just a couple of closing remarks. Um, Cloud Foundry is a great technology, um, so this, isn't a, uh, this presentation isn't meant to uh, uh, be, uh, be negative towards Cloud Foundry, um, but uh, Kubernetes uh, better met, met, met our needs, better meets our needs. Um, however, nothing is free. Um, if you move from Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes, as, as described along the way, um, new problems arise that you have to solve. Um, but in the end, we believe this was well worth it for us. You know, we were able to achieve greater performance, um, scalability, reliability, um, et cetera, uh, than we had before. So, so we're really glad uh, we made the move. And so I guess, uh, are there any questions at this point? I think we have a, a few minutes left for questions. Yeah, in the back. Excuse me? Where is our cluster host? When we moved out, uh, okay, you got a microphone coming. <laughs> yeah, just wondering. Hello? Oh. Yeah, I was wondering where your cluster was hosted. Is it just on IBM Cloud? Oh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, it is uh, the uh, IBM Cloud uh, Kubernetes service is what we use, and uh, it's available in, uh, I don't even know if we use all the regions it's available in, but we've got like nine of those clusters worldwide within the IBM cloud itself. So, so, the, uh, so the IBM cloud console <laughs> runs within the IBM cloud. Other questions? Oh. And I, I think we've got a microphone coming. Yeah, uh, I guess on the Kubernetes side, you use mostly uh, standard tools like Kube Control, Helm, and everything. And from a developer standpoint of view, uh, when you moved from your Java monolith to, I guess, if I understand correctly, you moved to Node, uh, Node backend microservices? Yep. So it's a big change. It, it was a very change. big change, yes. So uh, <laughs> was there any help, developer tools, plugins, IDs, what was the most helpful things? We, so, so I, you know, I have whole presentations where I go in our journey from monolith to microservices a, as well. Um, I think when we started, we were probably a bit naive <laughs> about what it was going to take. So I don't know <laughs> that we necessarily used all the best tools and best practices along the way. Um, but, but really what we did there, you know, we had a, the Java monolith, as you mentioned. Um, we tried to find slowly over time like various pieces that could be pulled apart. So we, so we started building these node microservices that would run side by side the Java one. Um, so we were able to, because we also had this live in production and had to keep <laughs> satisfying our existing users. But, but over time, um, you know, we had the Java app deployed to Cloud Foundry. We started deploying Node.js apps, which of course has some, uh, you know, the different, different tools you might use with Node than with Java. And, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, the team had to gain, <laughs> gain those skills at the same time we were doing that and, and maintaining the product. So, so it really took us you know, probably two years to fully um, get rid of the monolithic app and have just node, node microservices. I don't know if that answers your question about tooling and stuff, but uh, <laughs> you know, now I feel like we, you know, we use pretty good you know, node tooling and DevOps processes and things. Maybe any, not. Maybe not at the start of the process. I can't say we did. <laughs> did any particular tooling? I mean, like the most popular tooling for Node.js microservices that you use? Um, plugins, IDs, anything? Um, so we we don't really dictate to our team what IDEs and things to use. I mean, I, I personally use Sublime Text. You know, others 
you know, not, and you wouldn't really call Sublime an IDE either necessarily. Um, so, I, so I don't know that I have one blanket um, recommendation there. Um, but, but we do have a, the big thing we have set up is that um, you can run, uh, we call it our local dev proxy. So we, can ha we have it set up so you can run a proxy locally um, and only the microservice or two you really care about, you want to develop with. And the others we just proxy out to, uh, to, our other to, a de to an actual deployment in our, in our dev environment. So, so we don't require you to get all 50 <laughs> microservices locally and run those in, you could run them in Minikube or something, but, but uh, that would still kind of <laughs> be tough for most systems to handle 50 microservices. So, so we at least ha have done that process, which has been a big help for us. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yep, no problem. Is there time for maybe uh, one, one more question? Okay, well, uh, thanks very much for your time um, and hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Thanks.